So I'm, I'm watching a drop fall into the water in my sink, and I notice it produces a circular wave that expands symmetrically outward from the point where the drop hit the water. Wanting to see this phenomenon on a larger scale, I go to the shore of a large body of water and throw in a rock. And I watch as the circular wave expands symmetric... Uh, huh? Wait a minute. It's not symmetric. It's expanding faster to the right than to the left. Why, the wave isn't even centered on the point where the rock entered the water. Aha, of course. Yes, Sherlock. The body of water must be moving to the right. Indeed, if I wanted to see a symmetric wave, then I should have followed the current along the shore. And from that point of view, the ground would appear to move, but the water would appear to be at rest. In that case, the wave would have expanded symmetrically from a fixed point of entry. That is the unique frame of reference from which to, quote-unquote, properly view a water wave. Okay, so what does that have to do with the theory of relativity? Well, just about everything. There's a curious ambiguity in classical mechanics. Although in daily life we generally consider how things move relative to Earth, the laws of mechanics don't define any ultimate frame of reference. <laughs> In fact, let's consider the following mechanical interaction between, oh, I don't know, say, ping-pong ball and paddle, when viewed from three different cameras, or we'll call them reference frames. Case 1. Collision viewed by a camera that's stationary with respect to the paddle. The ball's speed before and after the collision is the same, hence the kinetic energies of the two objects don't change, and there's no kinetic energy transfer. Case 2, the collision is viewed by a camera that's moving to the right relative to the paddle. The paddle appears to give the ball a whack and cause it to move faster after the collision than before. And so in this reference frame, it appears that kinetic energy has been transferred from the paddle to the ball. In case 3, the collision is viewed by a camera moving to the left relative to the paddle. From this point of view, it appears to be the ball that's doing the whacking, with the result that the ball's speed after the collision is less, and hence it appears kinetic energy has been transferred from the ball to the paddle. So it's obvious which camera recorded the real event, right? Uh, I mean, you can't have energy being transferred from the ball to the paddle, and from the paddle to the ball, and at the same time, no energy being transferred at all, right? I mean, obviously, physics should tell us what really happened, right? <laughs> Nope, this is an example of Galilean relativity, first described by, well, Galileo in 1632. If the laws of physics work in one reference frame, then they also work in any other frame that's moving uniformly in a straight line relative to the first frame. The fact that different observers can have different interpretations of the same physical event doesn't mean one's right and one's wrong. It's just right in their own particular frame of reference. There's no single correct interpretation. If you're flying at near the speed of sound, you are quite correct to say that your cup of water is, quote, at rest. True, it's blazing across the sky, according to people on the ground, but it stays put on your fold-down tray just fine. It's at rest relative to your perfectly valid frame of reference. Einsteinian relativity builds on the Galilean version, so let's get this one under our belt first. We typically take this piece of the puzzle for granted since we have day-to-day -day experience with it. It seems intuitive. But if it seems bizarre that Einstein showed that the interpretation of time depends on your frame of reference, keep in mind that Galileo had already showed us that the interpretation of energy transfer in a collision also depends on your frame of reference. Suppose you and your fellow Latins place a frame of reference at rest in space, which allows you to determine the respectable Latin coordinates x and y of any given point. And let's say you also have a clock that tells you the time t. Along come some troublesome Greeks with their own coordinate system moving to the right along your x-axis with velocity v and labeled with the quite tacky Greek letters psi and eta. And they even have their own clock and they call the time tau. You find that t and tau agree and y and eta agree, but their psi coordinate is a mess. You explain that they need to add the velocity of their reference frame times the time to their psi values to get the true at rest x values. You even make a plot of space versus time, a space-time diagram to illustrate the Greek's problem. If an object is at rest at position 3 at time 0, then at, let's say, time 4, it'll of course still need to be at position 3. It's at rest after all. But the Greek frame is moving. 
So constant psi values, the red lines here, actually correspond to moving points. It's not at rest. You explain that if at time zero an object was at x equals three and psi equals three, then at time four to have remained at psi equals three would need to be moving with a velocity v along with the Greek reference frame. But a truly at rest object, which at time four was still at x equals three, would actually have a psi coordinate less than three. This is very clear. Imagine your surprise when the Greeks explain that, excuse us, but we are the ones at rest, and you upstart Latins are actually moving to the left with velocity v. It's your x-coordinate that's messed up. To get the proper at-rest psi value, you obviously need to subtract off your frames of velocity v times the time. You're particularly shocked when they show you a space-time diagram that shows your Latin coordinates as the moving frame. You argue back and forth about who is really at rest, but every mechanical experiment you cite, the Greeks can turn around and interpret it to show that they're the ones at rest. It eventually dawns on all of you that there's no way to demonstrate that you're at rest in space because space is not a thing. You can't measure velocity with respect to a non-thing. No, velocity, including zero velocity or at rest, is a relativistic concept that has no absolute meaning. But then a light goes on in your head. Uh, well, not that kind. Uh, yeah, no, that's better. A and you recall your rock in the water experience. Wave phenomena do define the unique reference frame, the one that's at rest with respect to the oscillating medium. And since it's the late 1800s and there's abundant experimental and theoretical evidence that light is a wave phenomenon, you propose to use an optical version of the rock and the water experiment to establish the one, the only, universally at rest reference frame. Now there is something that gives you pause. In a water wave, you know that water is the stuff oscillating. And in a sound wave, air is the stuff oscillating. But in a light wave, what exactly is the stuff that oscillates? Unlike sound waves, light waves obviously propagate through, quote, empty space. So the oscillating stuff can't be any known material. But, you say, even if we don't yet know what it is, there's got to be something doing the, quote, waving, right? I mean, that's just common sense logic and reason. So let's just call it the luminiferous ether and try to find the reference frame at rest with respect to it. So you call up your respected colleagues, Michelson and Morley, and you ask them to devise an experiment to measure velocity relative to this luminiferous ether. Their elegant solution, the so-called Michelson interferometer, sends a light wave out from a central point, the magenta dot here, like the rock hitting the water. And this wave is reflected from two mirrors that are at the same distance, but in different directions. If the apparatus is at rest relative to the ether, the waves will be symmetric and the two reflected waves will strike the central point at the same time. However, if the apparatus is moving relative to the ether, the waves will not be symmetric, just as in the water experiment we saw before, and the reflected waves will strike the central point at different times. By measuring the difference in time of these reflected waves through a process called interferometry, this apparatus can therefore definitively measure velocity through this luminiferous ether. And we know that at least sometimes the Earth has to be moving relative to the ether because it orbits the sun. So whichever way it's moving today, it'll be moving the opposite direction in six months. Anyway, Michelson and Morley set up a practical implementation of this interferometer and they make measurements over an extended period. And the results, published in November 1887, failed to detect any motion of the Earth relative to the supposed luminiferous ether. Fast forward to the 21st century where supersized Michelson interferometers operate 24-7 as the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And although they were built for another purpose, a byproduct is that they run continuous 24-7 Michelson-Morley experiments with mind-boggling precision. And we still haven't seen any evidence for a moving ether. If we had, it would have meant that the speed of light would have been different in different directions and in different reference frames. But the negative result of the Michelson-Morley experiment instead suggests that the speed of light is the same in all directions and in all inertial reference frames. And there is no evidence that light is the oscillation of some medium that would define a unique reference frame, quote, at absolute rest.
This experimental fact just put our, quote, common sense logic and reason in the trash. Consider our two coordinate systems from before, and imagine we send out a flash of light at time zero when their origins coincide. If the speed of light is the same in both frames and in all directions, it means that as time goes on, both frames perceive their origin to be the center of the same expanding wave, even though those two origins are moving apart. How can two different circles be the same physical object? Or how can one circle have two different centers? Based on our day-to-day -day intuitive ideas of space and time, these concepts are totally absurd. And yet the Michelson-Morley experiment tells us that in some sense, this is just how things are. In the next video, we'll see how through this bizarre turn of events, a young Albert Einstein perceived a fundamental property of nature, the principle of relativity. The same laws of electrodynamics and optics will be valid for all frames of reference for which the equations of mechanics hold good. While on first glance this may not seem to say much, the theoretical implications forced a profound change in humanity's understanding of space and time and energy and mass that is, of basic physical reality. The speed of light is the same in all directions in all inertial reference frames, and that there is no evidence that light is the oscillation of some material. That terminology, inertial reference frame, keeps coming up, so just to review, that's a frame in which if I put something at rest, it stays at rest. If I push it, it moves with a uniform velocity. And that's true pretty much at the surface of the Earth in two directions corresponding to the ground but not in the third direction corresponding to up and down. Of course, there is the force of gravity that makes that a non-inertial frame. Towards the end of making sense of this, a young Albert Einstein proposed a general principle of nature, the principle of relativity. The same laws of electrodynamics and optics will be valid for all frames of reference for which the equations of mechanics hold good. The goal of this video is to rigorously work through the implications of this, arriving at Einstein's so-called special theory of relativity, which he first presented in 1905 in a paper titled, at least the translation is titled, On the Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies. But we're going to de-emphasize the math and try to work through things in a more graphical approach. And this is primarily due to a fellow named Minkowski. He presented these concepts in a 1908 presentation called Space and Time, and both of these papers are available in the excellent Dover Publications book of reprints of the original papers, at least the translations they were originally in, in German, uh, available for about $10 from Dover Publications. The speed of light is central to relativity, and since it keeps coming up, it'll make our life a lot simpler if we take it to be one. In other words, if we choose units in which the speed of light is one, a simple way to do that is to keep the second as our unit of time, but instead of meters, to use light seconds as the unit of distance. So a light second is approximately 300 million meters, which is almost the distance to the moon. If we do that, then the speed of light is one light second per second. Of course, this will make our day-to-day -day velocities very small. For example, a very large velocity to us is the speed of sound, roughly 330 meters per second. In this system of units, that becomes approximately one millionth of a light second per second. In other words, the speed of sound is about one millionth of the speed of light. Now back to the classical points of view that have us in a bind. We assume that we have two reference frames, one labeled with Latin letters, one with Greek letters. The Greek frame moves to the right relative to the Latin frame with a velocity v. We assume that everybody measures the same time, t or tau. Coordinates that are not in the direction of motion, that is, for example, y or z coming out of the board, would be the same, remain the same, but the coordinate in the direction of motion, x and psi, would drift. They drift because of the motion of the coordinate systems. So x would be equal to the psi coordinate of, say, the green dot, plus the offset of the Greek coordinate system, v times time. Our dilemma is that experiment tells us that if we set off a pulse of light, both of these coordinate systems have to perceive themselves to be at the center of that circular wave. So for example, consider the blue point here, which would be perceived in the Greek frame as being on the center of that wave front. It would have traveled a certain distance in a certain amount of time, consistent with the speed of light being unity in the Greek frame. 
But if our classical concepts are correct, in the Latin frame, it would have traveled a greater distance in the same amount of time. Hence, it would be traveling at a greater velocity. The speed of light would be different in the two frames. This is readily apparent on a space-time diagram. If we imagine going along the horizontal axis four units of time and then going up four units of spatial displacement in the Latin system, that would be corresponding to the blue lines, we would go up to the blue point. And the slope in the blue coordinate system would be four units of space per four units of time, so a slope of one. That's the green line that goes through the blue point. In the Greek frame, though, we would go step off the same four units of time, but then we would have to go up four of the red coordinate lines. Those correspond to the Greek frame. And again, because the Greek frame is moving relative to the Latin frame, those lines are sloped. So we end up at the red point. That's psi is equal to 4 at time t is equal to 4. Now in the Greek frame, you would still have a speed of light, which would be 4 units of space and 4 units of time. But that same red point in the blue frame, in the Latin frame, of course, would be more than 4 units of space in 4 units of time. It would correspond to a larger velocity than unity. In other words, it has a larger slope. Looked at another way, we have two lines here, both of which are supposedly representing the same physical wavefront. In the Latin frame, you have one unit of time, one unit of displacement, and that defines from the blue triangle one of those green lines. In the Greek frame, one unit of time, one unit of displacement defines the red triangle and the second green line. But the Michelson-Morley experiment tells us that these two lines have to coincide. Both of the frames of reference have to measure the same speed of light. Now the problem arises because of the slopes between the lines of constant x and constant psi. But this also suggests a very elegant, seemingly very simple solution, which nonetheless has profound implications. We simply need to introduce a corresponding drift or slope for the time coordinate. Now, one unit of spatial displacement over one unit of time gives us the same speed of light, the green line, whether we look at it in terms of the Greek frame or the Latin frame, in terms of the red or the blue coordinates. Now note that this is only true for the speed of light. If we look at other speeds less than one, for example, a speed of one half, say, a displacement of two spatial units in four units of time, we'd get the two triangles shown here. And notice that in this case, the two frames of reference would not agree that they were looking at the same velocity. The agreement comes only when the velocity is the speed of light, unity. For example, in this case, if we have four units of displacement in four units of time. To describe this mathematically, we need to add the two terms shown uh, underlined here in green. Before, in the classical Galilean relativity, we assumed everybody agreed upon time, but they disagreed upon spatial coordinates. Now, if psi is equal to x minus vt, we have the symmetrical relationship that time tau is equal to t minus vx. Correspondingly, if x is equal to psi plus v tau, then t is tau plus v psi. Those new terms create that slope between these lines of constant time. We have now two different time coordinates that are completely symmetric with respect to the spatial coordinates. Everything now is symmetric about the diagonal green line, which, remember, represents the speed of light. And we've gotten all this primarily by looking at pictures, although we're not quite there yet. There's one little wrinkle we still have to fix. But before we move on, let's stop and see if this passes the giggle test. I mean, could this possibly correspond to reality? Maybe mathematically this fixes our problem, but we've just said that different moving observers will have different time coordinates. Now, do we have any direct experience of that? Not at all. It seems completely absurd. But remember that this picture corresponds to those special units we chose to make the speed of light be 1. We measure time in seconds, but spatial displacement in light seconds, about 300 million meters, almost the distance to the moon. That means our day-to-day -day life takes place in a little box that is extremely wide in the time coordinate, but very, very short in the spatial coordinate. 
right? We don't have daily experience with uh, light second type displacements, but we certainly move through many hundreds of seconds even just watching this video. So our experience never takes us up towards the top parts of this plot where you would actually see the divergence between those T and tau axes. Now let's fix up the little detail I alluded to. And we do at this point have to do by necessity just a little bit of algebra, but it'll be worth it. Here are the transformations between space and time for the Latin and the Greek coordinates. And the terms with the red boxes around them are the new terms, the terms that deviate from the classical Galilean relativity, that create that symmetry that causes everyone to see the same speed of light. Now, if we start off with x and t values and transform those to Greek values, psi and tau, and then use the second set of equations to transform back to x and t, we should end up where we started from. We should have x equals x and t equals t. If we substitute the first set of equations into the second, we end up with four terms, and x equals x and some other stuff, t equals t and some other stuff. Now the second and third terms that have the blue boxes around them cancel out. Minus vt plus vt, minus vx plus vx. Unfortunately, the last terms, the fourth terms, do not cancel. And that leaves you with a v times a minus vx, and in the second equation, a v times a minus vt with the net result that your equations say x equals 1 minus v squared times x, which of course isn't equal to x, and likewise for t. Indeed, 1 minus v squared is something a little bit, at least a little bit, less than 1. So in transforming from one system to the other and back, we've had some shrinkage. Well, the obvious way to counteract that would be with a little bit of expansion or dilation. So we now arrive at the final theory. We have a dilation factor, beta, is 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared. And we simply multiply our transformations by that dilation or expansion factor. If we do that, then when we substitute the first set of equations into the second set, we end up with two factors of beta, or a beta squared, which would be 1 over 1 minus v squared. That will cancel out the 1 minus v squared that was causing us the problems. The shrinkage will be canceled out by the dilation. These then are the final equations for the transformation between space and time in special relativity. To be completely rigorous, we should show all three spatial coordinates in time, but the other two spatial coordinates are kind of boring. The ones that don't correspond to the direction of motion don't have any unique transformation properties. They're just, they just stay the same. So now we have complete three dimensions of space and time for systems which are moving along their respective x or psi axes with velocity v. Just for giggles, let's go back and check out Einstein's original paper. There's his results. Huh. Our results? His results. Now, he didn't use units in which the velocity of light was 1, so c the velocity of light shows up in his equations. But notice, if you make c equal to 1 in his equations, you get the equations that we just derived. Yeah, no, this Einstein kid, he passes. He's okay. You know, he, no, we fact-checked him. Yeah, yeah. He, I mean, not, not a very elegant derivation he's got there, but, you know, I guess he couldn't handle pictures. We just had to, you know, keep an eye on the kid. Yeah, yeah, just uh, all in a day's work on YouTube. Yeah. Seriously, though, we have, in a few short minutes, rederived one of the great results in modern physics. And we have a rigorous basis now to push on in future videos to make predictions about how the world actually behaves and to compare those predictions to what's actually observed. But here we're going to look at some of the concepts presented in a 1911 paper titled On the Influence of Gravitation on the Propagation of Light. Special relativity deals with the physical equivalence of inertial reference frames. Recall that an inertial reference frame is one in which objects tend to stay put or move with constant speed in a straight line. Earth's surface is approximately a two-dimensional inertial frame, but the third dimension, up and down, as we well know, is subject to gravitational acceleration. As Galileo pointed out, to the extent that air resistance can be neglected, this acceleration has a very curious property. All objects, regardless of composition or mass, fall with the same gravitational acceleration g. Einstein started thinking about the deeper meaning of this fact. In particular, what are the implications for distinguishing between different 
frames of reference. Well, it's a lovely spring day here, so naturally I'm moved to hurl a ball of lead through the air. And there it goes at one-tenth speed. Here we plot the ball's position at one-sixtieth second intervals, and what we see is that it follows a curved trajectory, as is characteristic of accelerated motion. However, as mentioned previously, if we look only at the coordinate parallel to the ground, we see the constant velocity motion characteristic of an inertial reference frame. It's when we examine position in the up and down coordinate that we see the non-uniform motion due to gravitational acceleration. Yeah, man, that gravity thing, it's always pulling everything down. I mean, even if you nudge something upwards, it's darn gravity turns it around and pulls it right back down. You can't ever get anything to stay still, can you? Well, look here, Wilbur. It's a dang nab ball of lead a floating in the air. What the hell is going on? Well, I'll tell you what's going on, boys. I done jumped up, took my feet off the ground, and that there ball just went on a floating. Now, I know you're saying, fool, that ball's falling, just you and the camera's falling with it. And indeed, you've probably seen how airplanes can be used to simulate weightlessness by putting their occupants into a freely falling reference frame. So here's a question for you. Is Dr. Hawking's apple falling or floating? More precisely, suppose we have two identical boxes containing some objects. The box on the left is floating in, quote, empty space, while the box on the right is falling in the uniform gravitational field of a massive object. Are there any mechanical experiments that we can perform that would distinguish between these two cases? The answer is no, because all objects fall with the same gravitational acceleration there will be no relative change in position amongst the various objects in the falling box. Consequently, there will be no way to tell the difference between falling and floating. And now Einstein applies his principle of relativity. If these two frames of reference are mechanically equivalent, they must be optically equivalent also. Now imagine pulses of light sent from one side of each box towards the other side. For the floating case, of course, the pulse of light will travel at a constant speed in a straight line from one side of the box to the other. However, if light travels in a straight line relative to the ground, then the falling box will necessarily have to perceive the beam of light to be curving upwards. However, if the principle of relativity is correct, the path of light in both boxes must be identical. This will mean that people on the ground must necessarily perceive the ray of light to be bending downward. That is, the light is perceived to be falling in the gravitational field, just like a mechanical object would. This is how Einstein was able to conclude that gravitational fields bend beams of light. And moreover, he could calculate how much bending would occur. Suppose a pulse of light is traveling from left to right at the speed of light, it travels a distance L across the screen. That takes a time L over C. But during that same interval, gravitational acceleration imparts a velocity G times T in the downward direction. And since T is L over C, that's G L over C. And that results in the beam being bent at an angle, which is approximately the ratio of those two velocities, that is G L over C over c, or theta is equal to gl over c squared. A similar analysis allowed him to calculate the total bending that would occur when a beam of light passes by a star. If capital G is the gravitational constant and m is the mass of the star, Einstein's result was that theta was equal to 2 gm over the speed of light squared divided by r0, which is the minimum distance between the center of the star and the beam of light. In the final general theory of relativity, this value actually gets bumped up by a factor of two. Nonetheless, this made the prediction that light passing near the sun would be bent by about one three thousandth of a degree, or just about at the resolution capability of Earth-based astronomical observations. For a very large mass, say a cluster of galaxies, this bending could be enough to produce what's called gravitational lensing, in which a single object appears in multiple ghost images. Here's a beautiful example from the Hubble Space Telescope. In the center you have a cluster of galaxies and surrounding that you have these ghost images of a single object. Now what is the physical mechanism by which a beam of light is bent? Light is an electromagnetic wave. The bending of a beam corresponds to the bending of wave fronts. 
wave fronts bend or refract as they pass through regions in which the speed of light is different. Suppose the blue lines here represent wave fronts and the red curves represent light paths. In order for the wave fronts to be tilted relative to each other, for there to be bending of the light rays, those two paths must be different in length. Suppose the difference in height between the two paths is a little amount dh, and suppose the length of the lower path is l. Then the upper path must have a length of l plus a little bit more delta, which is theta dh, where theta is the angle through which the light beam has bent that same theta that we derived previously. The only way to travel a greater distance in the same time is to travel at a greater velocity, and therefore the speed of light must be larger on the upper path than on the lower path. So let's call the speed of light c on the lower path. On the upper path, it'll be c plus some small change dc. The ratio of those two velocities, c plus dc over c, is equal to the ratio of the path lengths of the distances covered in that same amount of time, L plus delta over L. Now, delta, as we said, is theta dH, and plugging in our previous result for theta and canceling the common factor of L throughout, we end up with this. The ratio of velocities is 1 plus G over C squared times dH. So the ratios of the speed of light on the two paths is 1 plus G over C squared dH dh is the change in height between the two paths. You can solve this to get directly dc over dh, the change in the speed of light per change in height. And the result is simply g over c, the gravitational acceleration over the speed of light. For Earth, if you plug in 9.8 meters per second per second for g and 300 million meters per second for c, you get 33 nanometers per second per meter. Uh, 33 nanometers is about the size of a virus. And so the speed of light increases for every meter you go above the Earth by about one virus width per second. Now that's a very small number, but if you had a much larger mass, and if you look at the change over a very large distance or height, you might get very significant changes in the speed of light. Let's take a look at this. So we have this basic result that the change in speed of light with change in height is g over c. g is the gravitational acceleration. Newton's law of gravitation says that that value g falls off as 1 over the distance from the center of the object squared. That is, little g is equal to big G, the gravitational constant, times the mass of the object m over h squared. h is the height measured from the center of the object. If you take that expression and plug it into the equation on the left, and if you assume that as h goes to infinity, as you get very, very far from the object, so that the gravitational field is essentially zero, that the speed of light takes on some value c0, which would be the speed of light in empty space, 300 million meters per second, then you can solve for the speed of light as a function of height from the center of the object. The result is that the speed of light as a fraction of the speed of light in empty space is the square root of 1 minus some constant rs over the height h. And the constant rs is 2 gm over c0 squared. If you plot the speed of light versus height h, you see that as h decreases down to be equal to this constant rs, so that h over rs is equal to 1, the speed of light decreases down to 0. Apparently, under these conditions, light would stop propagating, it would freeze in some sense. And we would certainly be justified in calling such a thing a black hole. Interestingly, this constant rs turns out to be precisely the so-called Schwarzschild radius that comes out of the rigorous general theory of relativity, uh, or we could call it the radius of a black hole, or typically the radius of the black hole's event horizon. It's important to emphasize that we just got lucky. This is not a rigorous derivation, but it certainly is showing some of the concepts that will have to go into a general theory of relativity and some of the bizarre things that will come out of this application of this very simple concept of the principle of relativity. Now, just to get some orders of magnitude to see what kinds of conditions might pertain to this frozen light phenomenon, if you plug in the mass of the sun, you get a radius of about 3 kilometers. Uh, if you plug in the mass of the Earth, you get a radius of about 9 millimeters. So in the case of the Earth, you'd be talking about a ball 
about two centimeters in diameter, about the size of your thumb, containing the entire mass of the Earth. Or in the case of the Sun, a ball about six kilometers across with the entire mass of the Sun. That's an incredible prediction. And it's come out of nothing more than Galileo's observation that all things fall with the same gravitational acceleration and Einstein's insight into this fundamental principle of relativity. That relativity describes events in space and time as seen from two or more inertial reference frames in uniform relative motion. We'll draw a frame, quote, at rest with blue axes labeled with Latin letters, and then a red frame labeled with Greek letters that'll be moving along the x-axis with velocity v. Suppose the flashing lights here represent space-time events in the blue frame. Special relativity tells us how these events appear in the red frame. We saw the need for a dilation factor beta, which equals 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared. Two of the space coordinates, y and z, remain the same, but the space coordinate in the direction of motion and time transform in a way that mixes up space and time between the frames. We develop these equations using an elegant graphical representation. Time is plotted horizontally, and the single interesting space coordinate is plotted vertically. The rest coordinates are blue, and the moving coordinates are red. We can plot events as seen in the rest frame, and then read off the corresponding red frame coordinates, or vice versa. The 45 degree green lines represent the speed of light in both frames. Now we'll take on the famous twin paradox, also sometimes called the clock paradox. The scenario is that two twins are born on Earth. One gets in a spaceship and travels away at high speed for some years, turns around and returns to Earth. When reunited, the space twin turns out to be younger than the Earth twin. This is sometimes called a paradox because if motion is relative, why wouldn't the experience of the twins be completely symmetric? We'll find out shortly. To analyze the physics, we'll use three reference frames. The blue is the Earth, or the rest frame. The red is the outgoing frame. And the green is the incoming frame. The space twin will ride the red frame away from Earth for some time and then jump onto the green frame to return. All we need to do is make a space-time diagram showing the three frames. Plot the key events as seen by Earth twin and then read off those events as perceived by space twin. Because the numbers work out nicely, I'll take the velocity to be three-fifths the speed of light. Then the dilation factor beta is five-fourths. We'll see that this tells us that five years for Earth twin will correspond to four years for space twin. Here's our experiment as seen by Earth twin. Event A, the twins are born and space twin leaves Earth. Event B, after five years, space twin is three light years away and she jumps from the outgoing red frame to the incoming green frame to turn around. Event C. After five more years, space twin returns to Earth. Here are the events in Earth twin coordinates. A and C occur at Earth, that is x equals zero, and at years zero and ten. Event B, the turnaround, occurs midway at year five on Earth, and since the speed is three-fifths the speed of light, at a distance x equals three light years. Between events, space twin moves uniformly along the line shown. Let's look at the first half of the trip in detail. Space twin is in the outgoing red frame for five years, again as seen on Earth. So here we'll plot the constant position and constant timelines for the blue and red frames at spacings of one half year in time and one half light year in space. Since space twin is at rest in the red frame, she'll follow a constant red position line. Every time she passes one of the red constant timelines, she'll experience one half year of aging. This continues for eight half years, hence four years, at which time space twin reaches the turnaround event. Now she jumps from the red frame to the incoming green frame. Space twin is now at rest in the green frame, so she follows a green line of constant position back to Earth. Each time she crosses a green constant timeline, she experiences another half year of aging. Here's the complete journey in Earth twin's frame, with black dots indicating half year intervals as experienced by space twin. She experiences a trip lasting eight years, four out and four back. While to Earth twin, the trip lasts 10 years, five out and five back. So he'll be 10 years old while his twin sister is only eight years old. Remember that the dilation factor beta is five over four, and we see this is the ratio of time intervals experienced by the twins. Well, that's what the theory says, and this is all because the speed of light has to be the same in all three frames. This is a truly weird result, so let's examine it in more detail. 
First of all, what does it mean to say that someone who is three light years away is four years old? That's what our picture says, but how would we verify this? Let's quote good old Albert here. All our space-time verifications invariably amount to a determination of space-time coincidences. The introduction of a system of reference serves no other purpose than to facilitate the description of the totality of such coincidences. So let's couch the experiment in terms of space-time coincidences, things that could actually be directly experienced by a person. Assume the twins maintain a video connection via radio or light waves. Both record his or her image side by side with the video received from the other twin. What will they see in their videos? In all systems, the light or radio waves propagate along a path corresponding to the green diagonal lines on the space-time diagram. We can use this to follow light forward or backward in time and either toward Earth or toward the spaceship. Let's say it's year four on Earth. How old will Space Twin appear in her received video? We just follow a diagonal line from Earth back in time towards Space Twin and see where it intersects her space-time path. In this case, it's when she's two years old. So when Earth Twin is four years old, he'll be watching a video of Space Twin at age two. Likewise, when Space Twin is four, we can follow a diagonal line into the past from the spaceship back towards Earth. We find that it left Earth when Earth Twin was two. So when Space Twin is four years old, she'll be watching a video of Earth Twin at age two. We can do this for each twin's birthday. Here the yellow lines represent signals received by Earth Twin and the orange lines signals received by Space Twin. Remember that each twin records a video with images of both twins. So when the twins reunite, they'll have two videos, each showing the two twins. We'll put Earth Twin's video on the left and Space Twin's video on the right. In both cases, we'll plot Earth Twin's age in blue and Space Twin's age in red. Okay, let's see what we get. Overall, they see a very different unfolding of events. In particular, Space Twin's video ends after eight years, while Earth Twin's video lasts for 10 years. However, they both end up in agreement that they saw Earth Twin age 10 years and Space Twin age eight years. This is sometimes claimed to be a paradox by the following argument. We treated Space Twin as the one in motion, but relativity says that absolute velocity cannot be measured, only relative velocity. Therefore, we could just as well have taken Space Twin to be at rest and Earth Twin to be in motion. Let's think about this. In particular, consider the first four years of the respective videos. In four years, Earth Twin sees Space Twin age two years. Likewise, in four years, Space Twin sees Earth Twin age two years. Their experiences are completely symmetric. It doesn't matter which one is considered to be moving, they both see themselves aging more rapidly, four years versus two years for the other. Now consider the last two years of the respective videos. This is a bit more complicated because some stuff has already happened to break the symmetry, but let's work backwards. In the last two years, eight to 10, Earth Twin sees Space Twin age four years, four to eight. In her last two years, six to eight, Space Twin sees Earth Twin age four years, six to 10. Again, their experiences are completely symmetric. Running the videos in reverse from their endpoints, both twins see themselves aging more slowly two years versus four years for the other. If we put the first four years together with the last two years, we would see a completely symmetric result. Both twins would have aged six years. It would not matter who we consider to be in motion. This symmetry is broken by what happens in between. Here we label the symmetric intervals with green dots, the first four years and the last two years in each frame. One thing that jumps out is the symmetric intervals involve communication between only two frames. During the first four years, Earth Twin is receiving signals sent from the outgoing frame, while Space Twin is receiving signals while on the outgoing frame. During the last two years, Earth Twin is receiving signals sent from the incoming frame, while Space Twin is receiving signals while on the incoming frame. However, in between, there are asymmetric intervals labeled with red dots. Space Twin experiences an additional two years receiving signals while on the incoming frame, and Earth Twin experiences an additional four years receiving signals from the outgoing frame. This is the source of the two-year discrepancy in their final ages. The key symmetry breaking event is the frame jumping, which would be physically observable as it requires Space Twin to experience an acceleration. Earth Twin does not experience an acceleration. You can add any constant velocity to the entire system and you still end up with the results we obtained. Earth Twin always stays in the same frame, no acceleration, while Space Twin always jumps frames, accelerates. So the experience of the twins is not symmetric, 
only one twin experiences acceleration, that is jumps frames, and that is the one who ages more slowly. There's actually no paradox in the so-called twin or clock paradox. Time dilation has been verified in a massive set of experiments spanning more than half a century. Not only would the GPS system be unable to function without taking time dilation into account, but it would be absolutely impossible to design and build modern particle accelerators and to interpret the experimental data they produce.